and you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for your own health and fitness. Welcome to your own health and fitness. I'm health integrationist Lena Berman with Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett. We come to you weekly with a critical, independent voice on the politics and practice of health and the environment. The current updated statistics on Lyme disease is 300,000 cases annually. This is six times the rate of HIV, and it's 50% higher than breast cancer. This staggering number doesn't include many undiagnosed cases since Lyme disease doesn't always present with a rash or other clear markers and testing has been inconclusive at best. In fact, since the IDSA guidelines call for only two weeks of antibiotic treatment, which is woefully insufficient for most cases of infection with this syphilis-like bacterial spirochete, many cases go on to become chronic. These cases are confused with other serious neurological, psychiatric, cognitive, and even fatal diseases. Patients are accused of making their illness up, and many have died. Ah, until recently. Because of the work of one filmmaker and activists worldwide, the Lyme epidemic is starting to gain credulity despite the very effective work of the CDC and the IDSA to discredit them and the victims of Lyme and protect their financial interests. Join us now as we listen to an interview with filmmaker Andy Abraham Wilson as we unpack the deception and move forward today Lime from horror to hope. Andy Abrahams Wilson, thank you so much for joining us. Could you introduce yourself to our listeners? Uh, it's my pleasure. Um, my name is Andy Wilson. Um, I am the filmmaker behind the Oscar shortlisted Under Our Skin that came out in 2008. Um, and it's a story about... Um, the Lyme disease epidemic and the hidden story of Lyme and and the way the lack of um, uh, uh, governmental approach to this epidemic um, and the collusion between medical societies and the CDC in um, basically um, not telling the truth about the the epidemic and um, keeping people perpetually sick. Uh, We came out with an update to the film. It's called Emergence, Under Our Skin 2 Emergence, uh, just this past year. Um, And it is sort of the, it tells the ongoing story uh, uh, of Under Our Skin and of the Lyme disease epidemic. Um, It updates the characters from the original film and the controversies um, and crises that we portray in the original film as well. So it's an ongoing story. It's a it's a it's a slowly changing story, um, and um, I, I'd also like to say that there's despite despite that this, despite the lack of, of real movement um, on an institutional level, there really is a lot of of change, at least on a on a on a, the um, on the ground. And um, people are becoming educated. People are becoming aware of the epidemic more and more. And I think partly because of Under Our Skin and the way that that's really um, uh, reached a very broad audience, um, celebrities are getting sick. It's just coming out more into more in the news, um, and people are opening their eyes. And um, so, Emergence is is the continuing story, the continuing saga. Um, it's by no means concluded in terms of. Um, getting out the truth about this epidemic and um, getting help for the people who are sick. So but we're so, definitely making inroads. So, Andy, you are a filmmaker, is that correct? I am a filmmaker. I have been for uh, most of my adult life. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's both a creative...
creative interest, a passion, and I'd say also a calling. Um, the incidence of Lyme, uh, people probably don't realize, is now up to 300,000 a year. And, um, yeah, that is the, that's the CDC estimates. Now, it, uh, when, when we started under our skin years ago, the CDC estimate was 30,000. Everybody who was working in the Lyme disease uh, world, let's say, the Lyme literate physician, knew that this number was very, very low. Um, and since Under Our Skin came out, and this is something that we report in, in Under Our Skin too, the CDC upped the estimates from 30,000 to 300,000. That's a ten, tenfold increase. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine any other um, disease or condition having that kind of uh, uptick from um, moment to moment. Um, and yet uh, people working in the field, the, as I said, the Lyme literate physicians believe that this number is even low. So it's, it may well be greater than 300,000 a year. And just to put that into perspective, that's more than HIV and breast cancer combined. Yeah, it's um, double the rate of oh, breast cancer. Yeah, uh, epidemic. So the, when you the thing the thing that makes this complicated is that it started in Connecticut and many people died actually in Connecticut. But as you say, Lyme literate physicians these Lyme literate physicians have been bankrupt and have lost their licenses because the protocol or standard of care for Lyme follows a very narrow path. It says that if you um, suspect that you've been infected and you have symptoms like a rash, that you're treated with uh, an antibiotic for two weeks. And what we've discovered, particularly in Under Our Skin, is that people develop symptoms that nobody expects to be Lyme, like very high spiking fevers and extreme neurological symptoms, including Bell's palsy. Um, people become, they, they get confined to wheelchairs, young people. Uh, so it's, it's not what standard conventional medicine has expected. So these doctors who have been ground, have done groundbreaking work now are being harassed because the standard of care which is led by the CDC, is beyond inadequate, and they refuse to change the protocols. Yeah, you know, uh, Lyme disease is called the new great imitator, and the old great imitator, of course, was syphilis. And Lyme disease and, and syphilis are related. They're both spirochetes. They're, they're referred to as distant co cousins sometimes. Um, and they have a similar trajectory in the body in terms of uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary um, symptoms. Um, so it, what that means is the great imitators, it imitates all sorts of other conditions, neurological conditions, uh, musculoskeletal conditions, um, arthritic conditions, um, psychological conditions, and, and so on and so forth. So people are not getting diagnosed um, because there's not a lot of attention or information about Lyme, Lyme disease, um, your, your common physician um, is not diagnosing Lyme disease. And even if it's suspect, which is often not the case, the standard tests are not accurate. So that's the biggest problem is diagnostics. People are not getting diagnosed. Um, and then the few Lyme literate physicians who are out there who do know to look for Lyme disease and do know the, the, the better tests, the better laboratories rather, and some of the better tests to diagnose Lyme, um, are getting, uh, are, um, sidelined and as you said, in some cases persecuted because of their standard of care, which does not match up to the CDC endorsed IDSA, um, uh, recommendations, and that's the Infectious Disease Society of America. Some of these doctors have, as I said, uh, lost their licenses. They've been in court and are bankrupt because of these um, court cases and uh, have, in some cases, like I said, have, have lost, there are researchers who have lost their labs and things like that. Um, but they have, the ones that have been able to hang on 
have had remarkable effects on the patients that you follow up on in this film, Emergence. So some of these people have been sick for a very, very long time, and each with different types of treatments have recovered their lives. Right. And some of them are even drug-free. So, And these are people who were, again, confined to wheelchairs, um, yeah, that's, things that's like the, that. The, the remarkable thing and the really beautiful thing is that because we took this longitudinal approach, we worked on under our skin for probably about five years, and then since then followed the same people that we filmed in the original film. And um, pretty much all of them are doing better. Um, thanks to their Lyme literate physicians and their determination that what they had was not all in their head. That was just not some either psychological, psychosomatic condition or um, something that was just unknown and that the doctors couldn't figure out. They stuck with it. They stuck with their um, Lyme literate physicians and their treatment, and, and they're better. And so we wanted to inject a little bit of hope into this story because at times it does seem very hopeless, and certainly if you're going through it, it seems like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but there is. I mean, you know, for uh, you know, we we certainly can talk about the horror stories and the people who accepted the original diagnoses of MS or ALS or some other um, condition that either confined them to wheelchairs, debilitated them, or in, in many cases also took their lives. Um, so it's, you know, it's it, to see someone who was in, literally, in, in a wheelchair. And I'm thinking of one person from under our skin, a, a young, young, young a girl who lost most of her high school years. Um, Malena Cor- Connors. Malena Connors. Yeah, Mar- Marlena Connors. And, um, she was a ballerina and then she was, she was in a wheelchair for years and years and the doctors just, said there was, they thought it was all in her head, there's nothing wrong with her, um, uh, and then they said they didn't, they couldn't, just couldn't help her, and, and she got better with the treatment, uh, long-term treatment of her physician. Um, she's now out of the wheelchair, she's going, she's in pre-med um, school, she's, she's an EMT, emergency medical technician, driving an ambulance, and it's unheard of really unheard of to, to people who are wheelchair bound to to get out and live normal lives and that's thanks to um, her physician and to her family and to herself who did not accept the status quo and kept fighting and looking for answers and but that's that's a very small number of people who do that that's a very small percentage you think about all the people who just accept their diagnosis or accept what their frontline physician is saying and um and don't get better the um the protocol for this does not take into consideration as you said that this is a spiro- spirochete this is not a normal bacteria and spirochetes as syphilis is spiral into the tissues and also hide from the immune system so as you were pointing out there are many conditions that are being diagnosed that are likely to be Lyme infections like MS and ALS, but um, they're not being caught. And the other thing is that the the recommendations of treating it with 14 days of an antibiotic is woefully insufficient to treat this disease, which hides from the immune system and creates uh, an environment where it may even be creating an antibiotic resistant and causing a chronic condition. And yet, the CDC calls or the IDSA uh, is calling the doctors who treat Lyme quacks and the patients Lyme loonies, and they right. say and then that we, we document that in the film. That's one of the things that we that we, we we did a Freedom of Information Act and found emails in which the CDC and the IDSA, which is a private professional society, nonprofit by the way, um, is that, that these two organizations are in cahoots against the. Um, the Lyme, so the so-called Lyme literate physicians in the Lyme community, um, and that in itself is is really, a, um, uh, I'd say, 
gross misconduct at the very least. You're listening to an interview with filmmaker Andy Abrams Wilson. His two films about the politics and treatment of Lyme are Under Our Skin and Emergence. His website is underourskin.com. This story gets repeated in many situations, although in this situation it's so much more extreme since the the number of cases, even admitted by the CDC, outstrips the AIDS epidemic and outstrips uh, is double the amount of the breast cancer so-called epidemic and um, nothing is, is being done. And now we know that Lyme, like syphilis, is sexually transmitted and is also transmitted in pregnancy, in vitro, to the to yeah. the fetus. Well, let me say a few things about that, I, I, about a few of the things that, that you brought up. Um, it's not it's it, it, it's not um, in question, or it, there's no disagreement that Lyme disease is caused by a spirochete. Um, the question is, for, for most physicians, for the sort of mainstream thought, is 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 it or can it be chronic? Can it be chronic infection? And they're saying no, it can't be chronic. Um, with the um, uh, four weeks of antibiotics, there's no way that the infection can survive. Um, Alan McDonald from Under Our Skin, who we profiled in Under Our Skin, shows that he was one of the first people to show that that Lyme disease, that the uh, that Borrelia burgdorferi, the bacteria that caused Lyme disease, the spirochetes, can exist in biofilm form. Um, which protects them from antibiotics, which makes it, as you, you said, difficult to, to, to diagnose, to find, and difficult to treat, and renders it, by 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 uh, by that very nature, um, chronic. So that is starting to come out more and more and be accepted. You know, it's in a way a misnomer to even call Lyme disease Lyme disease, because what we know is the as the sort of overall condition of people who have Lyme disease, we now know it's not just Borrelia burgdorferi, the spirochete that, that causes Lyme disease. We now know that it's that there's a, a sort of confluence of factors, of co-infections, of um, environmental toxins um, that are that are making people sick, that are causing that's causing the the pathogenic um, response and so the question then becomes you know what if we don't call it Lyme disease at all or kind of we some some physicians some Lyme literate physicians are calling it uh, Borreliosis complex mm-hmm. or Lyme Borreliosis complex that it's it, it sort of tears apart our whole Western note linear motion um, uh, um, of uh, cause and effect of one pathogen creating one illness and one um, treatment for that. Because well, it's, it, 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 yeah. it's very complex. It's a puzzle that needs to be deconstructed. There are um, there are what we call co-infections, and yeah. those have been. It's not a secret that there are co-infections, and uh, there are also ticks that carry. There are tick vectors all over the world. So Europe and uh, Australia and uh, just all over the place, they're in. They're coming up with uh, cases of something similar and, and having the same kind of resistance by the medical institutions there, the medical establishment, about this because it's probably because it's diff- because they don't know what to do, and I think that's part of. There's two problems with. Lyme patients being um, insulted and ignored, and one reason is that uh, if if it doesn't work to give somebody a course of antibiotics, then they don't know what to do, and they have to go back to standard of care that they're used to, and so they're looking at vaccines. But the other problem is that the the body that sort of oversees all is the IDSA with the guidelines, the people who are coming up with the guidelines have severe conflicts of interest and are some of them are holding patents. Yeah, yeah. So we want to speak to that? Yeah, well, that's something that we initially brought out in Under Our Skin um, is that the, the people who were on the guidelines panel from the IDSA, there are 14 people on the panel, um, that the 
majority of them, 12 out of 14, had conflicts of interest. And that means that they were, in most cases, they had ties to vaccine, to companies that were working on vaccines. Um, it could also be test kits. Um, it could also have, have been um, um, experts in insurance cases against uh, Lyme literate physicians. Um, so there were, there were certainly conflicts of interest, um, which could be affecting um, their recommendations. So there was a big uproar about this. The Attorney General of Connecticut filed a suit against the IDSA. In the end, um, the uh, a so-called independent review panel was created, um, and basically the recommendations of the previous panel, the IDSA panel, was um, rubber stamped. Yeah, because they panel. weren't they weren't vetted. They had the same they, people. They weren't they weren't vetted. They were not. They you know it, it was one of, one of the things that one of the ways they were trying to avoid conflicts of interest was to say anybody who's made more than ten thousand dollars treating Lyme disease could not be on this committee. But that also that also excluded all the Lyme literate physicians who are working in the field. Um, who are on the front line, who know the most about the illness. And so basically they got a group of people who were um, part of the IDSA. It's it's you know, it's a big boys club. And 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 I say big boys because there was only one woman on the on that uh, on that fourteen people pit. Um, and uh, it it like I said it was rubber stamp these pe- the people who were on the uh, panel were not experts in the field and that's the way it is to this day there is actually a new they're in the process of um, uh, recommending new uh, creating a new panel and new guidelines. Um, for Lyme disease, so it's ongoing. And it's not. It, it's ongoing, yeah. and, and and again, there are not. There is at the. Uh, there, there's now a consumer, um, a patient representative, but that patient is uh, again not connected at all to the Lyme community. Has no. Um, um, has no experience in, in with Lyme disease at all, uh, and so so the Lyme community is very very. Um, uh, leery of the new recommendations and believes it'll just be more of the same. Why don't we go ahead? I'm yeah. sorry. Well, I just I just want to say that this is it, it's so that that's one problem. But as as you mentioned before, as we talked about, the collusion between the CDC and the IDSA is very problematic. Um, in emails that we found through the Freedom of Information Act, there's ongoing email discussions um, talking about. Uh, basically, um, um, framing the, the issue as a war with the Lyme disease activists that they have to, that it's a battle, it's a war, um, and that they can't win it on the scientific front, that they have to win it on the psychological front. Yeah, let's, let's speak to that for a moment because, uh, there are, there is, they absolutely demand that people be tested, of course that they have a serological test, but the serological tests are inconclusive at best and completely wrong. So they're attacked as not being conclusive. Um, and then there are these remarkable researchers who are coming up with these great new tests. One of them is remarkably intuitive and straightforward, which which is the doctor in Oslo, Norway, Dr. Morten Lane, uh, who is trained in my my cos- I can always say it's hard for me to say this microscopy, microscopy. yeah which is a 110 year old technique and he's you know obviously very good at it but he's discovered that if he just dilutes the blood with water and salt that he can see the spirochetes so it's right. very simple to tell this is the hardest thing about Lyme is whether somebody is resolved whether they're still carrying it particularly now that we know it's sexually transmitted and also it's carried to a fetus. We need to know whether any treatment is is actually effective. So he was. I mean, in Norway they don't usually do this, but they the CDC went after him and he lost his lab in Oslo. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, that's a good example of how this this issue is not just um, domestic. It's not just here in the United States. It's an international problem, and the same kind of political. Um, 
issues that exist here uh, exist everywhere, like as in Norway um, with Dr. Lane, as in Australia where there's, uh, there is Lyme disease is rampant and yet the official line is that there is no Lyme disease in Australia. Mm-hmm. And by the way, that's the same also in, in Canada mm-hmm. um, where uh, Lyme disease is not seen as a, as a as if there, there, the official line is that there is no Lyme disease in Canada um, as if ticks and any other ill or any illness just stopped at recognized international borders. Um, and uh, the Lyme treating physicians in Canada have all gone underground because they've been persecuted there too. So, so the IBSA, uh, which is an international body, um, is uh, has tremendous influence all over the world. And and you know, I, I talked before about the collusion between the IBSA and the CDC. You know, I think most people would be a little alarmed to hear that that. Uh, that uh, employees of the CDC actually hold patents um, or or have held patents um, uh, around the diagnos- diagnosis of Lyme disease. And um, this is something that um, we, we discovered. We found the, um, we actually found the, the, the patents which deal with the diagnosis, assessment and treatment of Lyme disease. Um, a representative from the CDC later told us that this was not true when, when it obviously was. And these same people, the same people, Barbara Johnson and Teresa Russell, who work for the CDC, were also um, 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 in charge of writing a rebuttal against a, a laboratory here in the United States, Advanced Labs, um, which claim to have cultured Borrelia spirochetes from human blood. And the CDC employees who um, refuted this study um, did not reveal that they had their own competing Lyme diagnostic patent. So that is very, that is very, very problematic. And Quite corrupt. Is, quite corrupt. Yeah, it's corrupt. Not just problematic, it is mm-hmm. quite corrupt. Mm-hmm. And yet this is the status quo. Joseph, and these are the people who are evaluating the laboratories, the tests of the, uh, uh, of those who are accused of, of um, violating standard of care. Joseph uh, Jemsek, who is a physician who uh, is now still back in practice, but is pretty much bankrupt and owes something like $10 million and legal fees, said about this that the lie is too big to confess. So one of the reasons why these groups are going to dig their heels in is because there's no face-saving move here. Mm-hmm. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, people are, anyway, it's just horrifying. Now, um, it's basically what it is, is, you know, it's, it's just um, don't cause a ruckus, let it pass, let it. You know, the, the film, when, when our film came out, that was the response. There were some, there were some letters from the CDC and the IDSA to PBS saying, don't air this. Um, it's, it's, um, uh, from their perspective, it was, um, it was false and misleading and caused hysteria. Um, but they also knew better to make a, you know, to, to, to create an uproar. Um, and the same with this film. You know, there has not been any refutation. There's not been any response to the to the um, to the statements that we make in the film. Um, they know that to, to bring this to a public level of, of any kind of public charges or um, any kind of public scrutiny will backfire on them. And so this is why it's all happening um, behind closed doors. We need to take. A musical break. We'll continue with our interview with filmmaker Andy Abraham Wilson. His two films about the politics and treatment of Lyme are Under Our Skin and Emergence. This is Your Own Health and Fitness. I'm Lena Berman. Please stay with us.
Lena Berman. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature. Get a free stream of this week's show, our book, Too Much Medicine, Not Enough Health, and lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. If you want to reach us, please email us at admin, A-D-M-I-N, at yourownhealthandfitness.org. You're listening to an interview with filmmaker Andy Abrams Wilson. His two films about the politics and treatment of Lyme are Under Our Skin and Emergence. His website is underourskin.com. Um, you did get you did get the first film, Under Our Skin, aired on PBS, which is a remarkable move. Did you get a big response? You know, I, I, I uh, yes. I mean, years later, the film is still getting a big response. And I think the greatest, the greatest, um, I don't know, uh, oh, proof of that and the greatest reward is that every day we have people writing us saying that the film saved their lives, um, that they didn't know that they were sick with this and it was through watching the film. They understood what was wrong with them and they finally got help. Or they showed the film to people, to loved ones and people in their family who could finally understand what they were going through. And this is, you know, we just get it over and over. Um, so the film's made a, a, a tremendous impact. I, I'm, and it's, it's very, very uh, satisfying and rewarding. You, you deserve it, it. It's a yeah, great, great. You. Both of the thank films, you. Both of the it, films it, are, it, are it really... Is, well, it's ongoing, let me, you let me know, say this, is, though. And it's, let, let me say this so that yeah. people can hear what I feel. Both of these films, Under Our Skin and Emergence, are extremely well-made films. They're very, very, uh, they're not just important because of the message, but the filmmaking quality of the, the way they're produced and the way they're edited and the filmmaking techniques are remarkable uh and the story is told in a really well really really well so these are absolutely wonderful films um how do people get hold of the film yeah how do people... thank you very much um under our skin dot com is the website and that has that has a lot of information not just about the films but about the issue and you know i want to say i appreciate what you said about the film and fundamentally i'm a filmmaker i'm not an activist i came to this as a filmmaker i want to make beautiful work i'm not an apologist for a cause um i didn't know what i would find when when i started this project it was it was actually the research and the data which led me to to where i am today it was not any kind of preconceived notion so you know the the I think that's really important to say that, and you know, when when you fall upon something that's um, so important, you you can't let it go. You know, whether you're a filmmaker, an artist, or or whatever you are, um, and that's why this is I talked before about it. It's part of a calling that I want to use use my gifts to to make a difference in the world and to help people. That's a lot of what the recovered patients and some of the Lyme doctors say about their lives is that they have been called to this work, that they feel like they're making a difference in the world, which is lovely and, and I think true. Let's despite move. the odds. Oh, yeah. despite the odds. So the vaccine, the uh, industrial medicine always goes to the idea of using a vaccine and they push them very hard. There are so many problems with the idea of a vaccine. The first is that now that it's now that it's out, now that there are reputable papers by good scientists that say that it's sexually transmitted, and and, there, and there's plenty of research that shows that it's um, it, it being transmitted to fetuses in pregnancy. If it means that there are probably many people who are infected who don't know it or who are, who are carrying. It in one way or the other without being sick. Um, you can't vaccinate a sick person and you also run the risk with a live bacterial, uh, at, you know, you're using material that's live, live bacteria that you will infect people and, and people did get sick from the vaccine when they tried to introduce it. So where are we at with the vaccine? Uh, 
Well, we talked about the vaccine in Emergence that, uh, you know, you know we, and we talked about it in, Under, in, in the original film, Under Our Skin, and, and um, it talked about some of the ties between IDSA uh, authors and the vaccine in- industry, and specifically um, Baxter, which is the company that was um, um, manufacturing a Lyme disease, a new Lyme disease vaccine. And... Um, in emergence under our skin too, um, the the concern was that uh, that all of this was pointing to a new vaccine. That the that the uptick from thirty thousand to three hundred thousand was part of this process to unveil a new a new vaccine, um, and that everything was sort of pointing in that direction. Um, and uh, was, since we finished under our skin too, um, Baxter pulled out. They, yeah. they pulled out of the Lyme vaccine um, enterprise. Uh, I don't know exactly. I think they were trying to sell it. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly what happened. But as of right now, there is not, um, to my knowledge, uh, an active vaccine program, um, which also recognizes the complexity of this illness, um, that um, uh, a single vaccine may not be effective. Oh, it may be harmful in the approach, and that it may be harmful as well. So I'd say, on, on, you know, on one hand, there some people uh, feel a relief that um, um, that you know, that that the vaccine is not it's not at least for now that it's that it's on hold because the original vaccine did harm people, and that's why it was pulled from the market. And this vaccine, by design, was not that much different from that original vaccine. Uh, so, with that not in the equation, um, I, I, and I and I want to say, I think part of the reason it's not in the equation is they realize that they've got a gigantic public relations campaign against working against them. They've got the the that the the uh, community which would which they would want to embrace it is not embracing it. Um, Including and the, and what what we've um, brought out in our films is also making the the uh, environment much more difficult to roll out a vaccine because you have to have buy-in for for such a vaccine and um, um, right now there's, there's there's not a lot of buy-in. Well, there's increased uh, there's increased people are paying attention to what's going on now. There's increased activism all over the world, and people are not being passive about this issue anymore so they're up against uh a lot of of um they're being they're being watched right so right so one piece of good news is that some of these doctors and researchers who have been so persecuted uh are still working so uh Berskano, who was a physician who lost his license to practice has been working with a biotech firm, and they came up with some new uh, diagnostic yeah, tests. Yeah, he didn't lose his license. He oh. he, um, he 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 Gave left up. voluntarily. Um, he got he got out of the business. Basically, he wanted to go into research. Mm-hmm. He was tired of the political climate, um, so he didn't actually lose his license. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, anyway, but they've come up with this diagnostic test, which is very promising. And then I think. Uh, People tried the CDC, etc. Tried to crush it, but my um, understanding is that in fact that test is now available. I think it's through Advanced Lab Services. Right. That was the and that was the the test that I was talking about before that the the authors from the CDC that um, that crushed that um, that that refuted this um, um, the paper the and uh, and the and the test itself. Um, we're holding a competing uh, uh, patent, so you know uh, it's you know although we expose that it's not you know it's that's not common knowledge. You know the only people who will find out about that are people who watch our film or who do some digging on their own. Um, it's just not common knowledge, and and yet the um, you know by by fiat just the the signature of a couple people from the CDC can doom a, a, a test that um, otherwise could could be helpful to so many people. So as far as that the advanced lab test goes, um, uh, I, I think that 
partly, you know, I think that the, the, the that without CDC, um, without the endorsement, it makes it much more difficult for them to operate. Um, but um, as far as I know, they are they are still operating. I don't know what their their next um, uh, what their sort of response is and, and how they will fare in the marketplace. So to speak. I will remind people that they can go to underourskin.com, underourskin.com, for information on how to get both films, Emergence and Under Our Skin, and for updates. Lastly, there is a new paper by uh, Robert Bransfield, MD, psychiatrist, on Lyme and behavior behavioral problems. So there is suspicion that, for instance, the Sandy Hook shooter probably had Lyme, um, his mother was diagnosed with MS, which is often a misdiagnosis that's often Lyme, and we know that Lyme is carried to, to infants in vitro, in, I mean in, in vivo, in, um, in utero. So we have this other layer now of uh, things to sort of fuel the fire to try to get people treated properly. The problem here is that, as you point out in the film, as the, um, the effective uh, Lyme docs who have persisted in treatments have discovered is that it takes a lot of it takes years of treatment um, some people are on antibiotics for years and years some people choose to go a different route uh, and get better so there's a, a complex of different treatments for Lyme but it's a very long treatment protocol and protection protecting people from Lyme and educating people about Lyme uh, is woefully inadequate. So mm-hmm. we're really just, I think, maybe just starting to understand this epidemic, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I think I think there's a lot more to to understand. There's definitely. I, I you know I go forth with a sense of humility, and I like. To I think a lot of the physicians, the Lyme literate physicians, do as well. That, for as much as they know, there's a lot more that they don't know. Um, and what you don't find is that same kind of humility on the part of the mainstream medical establishment. And I think part of what we're sort of uh, working against here is uh, is an old school um, is, is old school patriarchal medicine, um, which is which is having which is crumbling now, which has to, to crumble. Hopefully. We're doing yeah. our part. <laughs> yes, but but I mean I think that's part of what what what's going on here is that um, you know we all have to realize that we we don't have the answers and or all the answers and that um, the forum has to be open. It has to be open to dissent. It has to be open to um, alternative opinions. And up till now, that has not happened. Andy Abrahams Wilson from OpenEye Studios, his film, his new film is um, Emergence, which is uh, the sequel to Under Our Skin. Both films and information, lots of information, is on their website at underourskin.com. I am so grateful that you... Uh, not, no pun intended, caught, caught the bug to, to cover and educate people about this epidemic. It's so crucial and so important, and you've done such a good job. Thank you so very much for your work and for your time today on this interview. You're welcome, and thank you for your time dedicating um, to this cause and this issue. It's an important one. Thanks very much again. You are listening to a show that we're calling Lime from Horror to Hope. We have interviewed filmmaker Andy Abrams Wilson about his two films, about the politics and treatment of Lyme, Under Our Skin and Emergence. His website again is underourskin.com. What we'd like to do now is uh, listen to some clips from the film Emergence by Andy Abraham Wilson. Uh, The first clip is... Alan McDonald, who is a Florida medical pathologist, um, he's a researcher, um, and the clip is also going to include uh, the doctors Joseph Jemsek, M.D., and Joseph Burriscano, M.D. Dr. Alan McDonald uh, is the discoverer of a piece of his research is very important because he's discovered that the Lyme spirochete protects itself 
with a biofilm, which makes it antibiotic resistant. So this is this is the first piece of research that shows that Lyme actually can become chronic. Let's listen. And under our skin, Alan McDonald, Dr. McDonald, uh, first exhibited the role of biofilm. One night as I was looking at the culture of Borrelia, I saw a large colony of organisms protected by a gel-like substance. And as I was reviewing the pictures, it became clear that this was very reminiscent of what they call a biofilm. A biofilm is a hallmark of a chronic infection. It is a gelatinous substance that encases the germs and protects them from immune system attack and protects them from even antibiotics, rendering the infection more chronic and more difficult to treat. Chronic infection is denied by the Infectious Disease Society of America at all costs. Everything that is built into biofilms is essentially supportive of chronic Lyme infection. So this is really breakthrough research that we've just heard, and um, it kind of it's a game changer. Well, it's politically extremely hot. Um, I, I hope that everyone caught the the piece where Alan McDonald says that the IDSA, which is you've heard those, you're going to hear those initials a lot. ISDA is the Infectious Disease Society of America, which is a non-profit which has the power to establish rule, um, guidelines for treatment of infectious disease. So this is the, the, the big dogs uh, in infectious disease. And what Alan McDonald said is that they hate things that show that chron- they hate chronic infections. They'll do anything they can to um, prevent treatment and discovery of those, and that this discovery of biofilms directly supports the theory of chronic Lyme infectious diseases. They don't like chronic diseases because they don't really have anything to do. They they don't they can't they they don't have a drug that treats chronic diseases. So. It's a very difficult situation. So that leads us to the second clip, which is uh, what leads a little bit with some information about the attempt to come up with a vaccine and the fact that this vaccine development creates an interesting conflict of interest with the CDC and the IDSA. It leads, uh, this clip is, is going to be Chris Newby, who was the producer of Under Our Skin, the first film that and Andy uh, Abraham Wilson, Abraham Wilson uh, produced. So, again, let's listen here to Chris Newby talking about the conflict of interest here. If Lyme disease responds to 30 days of treatment across the board, what's the need for the new Lyme vaccine? One of the problems is that there hasn't been a strong interest in going after treatment options because most of the treatments are cheap generic antibiotics. But with vaccines, it's a patentable product and it's got a large market. It puts into question the scientific integrity of people doing the studies. Some of the consults in connection with this new vaccine are IDSA guideline members. Members of the CDC, IDSA, and others have patents for diagnostic testing and for vaccines. They've arrogantly used their pulpit to deny their patents. When I was doing research, it just appeared that the CDC was a key player in fanning the flames of the Lyme disease war. They wouldn't talk to us directly at conferences or they wouldn't answer our questions over the phone. My impression is that CDC and IDSA was trying to avoid having information released in a a nationwide documentary film. In July of 2007, we filed a Freedom of Information Act. It asked for um, emails from three employees and financial disclosures. By law, the CDC is supposed to release those documents in about a month. But uh, they weren't released for five years, four months, and 24 days. When I finally received the documents, we got 3,000 pages back. Uh, Over half were censored, and they never did give us their financial disclosures. The big thing is the CDC has been collaborating with the Lyme Guidelines authors in a way that's um, outside of government rules and regulations. 
So you're also hearing in that clip uh, Steve Harris, who is uh, another of these brave Lyme doctors, and again, uh, J- Joseph uh, Jemsek. These doctors have been horribly uh, persecuted, and uh, Joseph Jemsek is <laughs> he's he's got ten million dollars of legal fees now left for for himself and he's still trying to practice it's it's been very difficult anyway this 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 discussion of the conflict of interest is no surprise well it's uh very widespread um the uh in the middle there there was a discussion of cdc and is idsa um trying to prevent the film from being shown and uh just to reemphasize it's not just that they collude it's that they actively uh act in, to prevent the information from getting out cuz what they were discussing was trying to uh, prevent the film the original film under our skin from being shown on PBS N- not itself a particularly radical organization nevertheless it, it did get shown um, and so th- this is not an unusual particularly unusual unfortunately not particularly unusual thing it's just in this case so many people are affected and so horribly yeah this is really bad behavior the next clip that we're going to hear uh, is discussing the fact that th- these infections, these tick-borne infections, and I should mention they're also in some instances carried by fleas and mosquitoes, all these vectors, are worldwide. And, I mean, really worldwide, if you look at the map that they show. And it's possible that the places that don't light up in terms of having cases, lots of cases, are countries where they are denying it, which is happening in Canada and Australia. But there's an enormous amount of activism. And one of the things that they've discovered is that there are many, many different forms of Borrelia infections. And that one of the points that's making it difficult for people who are trying to treat and test and whatnot is that it has a name, which is the name of the town in Connecticut where it was first identified Lyme, L-Y-M-E, not Lyme's, but Lyme. And in fact, these Borrelia infections are multiple, and it might be better to completely change the name of this disease in order to help people to understand it differently. So let's hear this clip with patient, recovered patient, quite impressive patient, Mandy Hughes, who went on to become a nurse, um, who was terribly crippled by horrible neurological symptoms. And again, researcher Alan McDonald, MD. Lyme disease needs to be renamed, period. I don't care what you call it, but there's too much of a stigma and there's too much prejudice around Lyme disease. The moment those two words come out of patients' mouth, immediately, if you just look around, you'll see an eye roll. And that's how you know that person is no longer open or really should be treating that. We now need to divorce ourselves from the confines of Lyme as a word and as an easy to cure, hard to get infection and open it up to Borrelia complex as an easy to get, hard to treat infection due to multiple species and multiple co-infections. There are no rules for Borreliosis Complex on the CDC website. And IDSA has no rules for Borreliosis Complex. So let them have their Lyme. Let the rest of us have Borreliosis. And let's get on with life. Our next clip is uh, Dr. Joseph Jemsek, MD, again, uh, discussing this sort of problem with the fact that these organizations that are financially corrupt uh, are now dug in so well, it's, it's going to be hard for them to back out. There's no face saving. So let's hear Dr. Jemsek. It's become apparent to me that the lie is too big to confess. This is an insidious, progressive, highly debilitating illness which robs people of their lives, their souls, their ability to function. These sins committed are so great and so ugly and so large that it can't be negotiated out. So the lie is too big to confess at this point. 
The world is changing. And a smart country will do what the United States did not do. 28 countries right now, people are doing this about uh, tick-borne disease. So the voice you heard after uh, Dr. Jemsek was Ellen Fisher, who is a park ranger who was really seriously ill for an extremely long time, somebody who worked in Nevada uh, County in, in these parks, in the Sierras, uh, and he's very involved with the activism, and, and he's speaking at a, a rally, one of the many rallies shown in the film. We're, we're going to close with some cl- a clip of a variety of the patients. Not all of the patients are represented. There are many stories in these two films, and, and they're followed up in, in uh, Emergence. Um, but we, we just chose a few clips to give you a sense of what they, how they feel now and what they're looking forward to with uh, advice and help for people. Uh, they're very committed to working on this. And this also includes the uh, comments of Dr. Alan McDonald, the researcher, the uh, pathologist, and again, Joseph Jemsek, MD. Knowing everything that I've been through, I still wouldn't change it because of how much I've learned, all the people I've met. I know I wouldn't want to go into the medical field if this had never happened. Try not to get discouraged. If you feel that something is wrong with your body, you know your body better than anyone. You're the only one that lives in it. So don't let someone tell you that you're wrong. You can get better, and you will get better, I think, with self-care and diligence, um, slow and steady, you'll get well. I believe that each of us is here for a purpose, and I believe that if we have the good fortune to recover from a health problem, uh, maybe a very serious problem, uh, there's a reason for us to continue to be here and to do what we're doing. I can't think of anything more important to do with your life's work than to say, all right, we have 150 million people with chronic illness in our country, and we probably got a lot of it wrong. So I feel like if I have to continue the fight. I think we're going to win the fight. Um, the the patients that you heard were Melena Connors, who was a young ballerina who was confined to a wheelchair and is now up on her feet, working as an EMT, studying to become a doctor and lifting patients and whatnot. A remarkable story. Mandy Hughes, again, that we've heard before. And Dana Walsh, who uh, is a Bay Area a person who's gone on to create a website called Lime Less Live More, I think, dot com, or maybe dot org. So these recovered patients give us hope and the the words of these various doctors uh, even more than just McDonald and Jemsek discussing uh, their feelings about continuing this work is very hopeful so that's what we'll end with is that sense of hope I want to thank you all for listening. I'm Lena Berman. Visit our website, yourownhealthandfitness.org, for easier extended access to our over 600 archive shows with our library card feature. Get a free stream of this week's show, our book, Too Much Medicine, Not Enough Health, and lots more at yourownhealthandfitness.org. Our email address is admin, A-D-M-I-N, at yourownhealthandfitness.org. Your Own Health and Fitness is produced by Lena Berman and Dr. Jeffrey Fawcett. Jazz and Latin music have a long history of interaction and mutual influence. They are two branches of the same tree as Dizzy Gillespie and Mario Balsatais. Every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. on KPFA, join me, Art Sato, for the program In Your Ear as we explore the musical treasures from both of these worlds. From Ellington to Itaquira, up Cuba, from Coltrane to Palmieri, You'll find them all here on Saturdays, 4 to 6 p.m. on listener-sponsored radio, KPFA 94.1 FM.